Over the years, I've learnt some great money-saving ideas for the garden, both for plants and for the design structures. Usually, when you move into a house, you've got to spend money on boring things like fixing the roof and dripping taps, and the garden plays very much second fiddle. But what I like to do is I like to get the design sorted in my head and on paper. I like to then propagate up the plants or get the plants really inexpensively and get them in situ so they can really get growing over the years. And then when funds permit and you've got a bit more budget, you can come on and do the hard paving, the fencing and all those harder elements which usually take more of the budget. With the internet, the whole business of purchasing plants has totally changed. You had the retail garden centres and you had the wholesale nurseries before. But now many wholesale nurseries are actually selling things online to private customers as well. So I think that many people can save maybe two thirds of the plant price by going to a wholesale nursery. But obviously you won't be mucking around, you'll just get exactly what you want and you have to know exactly what you want. The thing is, when you go to a garden centre, you can have advice and you can say, can I put this purple hydrangea here? Will it grow on my soil? When you go to a wholesale nursery, you'll get none of that. You need to know what you want and you need to know the size of the plant and the types of the plant. The big, big gain when you buy wholesale is that instead of just going to a garden centre and your budget is tight and having one of this and one of that, when you go wholesale, it completely changes the whole spectrum of that. You can afford to get in nice big clumps of plants. And in any garden, if you've got a dolly mixture of one of this, one of that, one of the other, it always looks a bit of a mess. But if you've got a nice cohesive drift of this, that and the other with the odd sprinkling of um, the same plant dotted through it, you immediately have a much more cohesive look to your borders. And that is one of the best tips on planting that I can possibly think of. Then you've got the whole business of container plants, containerized plants and bare root plants. Three very different categories. Until the 1960s and the advent of garden centres in the UK, everything was sold bare root. And then when garden centres came along, they wanted to sell plants 12 months a year. So what did they have to do? They containerised them. And everyone thinks that container grown plants or containerised plants are better than bare root. But actually they're more expensive because they're heavier to move and they've got more with them, the compost. But they don't establish as well as a bare root plant in many, many cases. And this is because the container provides a perfect rooting environment with compost, fertiliser, moisture. You plant that in the garden and the roots tend to stay in that nice composty mix and not search out into the soil and get established. With a bare root plant, it has no option but to get its roots out into the soil and get going. So if you can plant in the autumn um, and through the winter periods when bare root plants are available, that is the best option to go for in many, many cases. Certain plants are root bald, so something like yew, Taxus baccata, is usually root bald because they don't containerize well or don't grow in containers well. So for a yew plant, go for the root bald if you can. Um, roses are usually containerized as opposed to container grown because they don't like being in a container much. So they have them in the ground growing bare root, but to prolong the season, they pop them into a container quickly and sell them within a few months. So that's containerized. So you need to know what you're paying for because what you're paying for indicates exactly what you're going to get. And don't forget the cheapest is often the best in terms of containerized or bare root. Obviously, the most inexpensive way to get your plants is to grow your own. I do many of my own plants from seeds or cuttings, and so I have tiny little plug plants like these here. And these are so small, if I put them out in the border straight away as a little seedling or as a little rooted cutting, many of the plants would become swamped and die away. So I like to grow them on in my hoarding borders. And so they have more care and attention than my plants in the borders. I'll check them over regularly and I'll look and see if they're going off colour and I'll just titivate them a bit or see what they're missing. And that way is brilliant. 
And I also do that if I go and buy a very expensive plant from a nursery that I can't propagate or I couldn't manage to get to root or grow from seed, I might buy one plant and then I grow it on in my hoarding borders. I take cuttings from it or I take seed from it. I propagate those on and then I have a lovely big clump in a few years to grow in my garden. If you look at my video on planting my new box hedging up, you'll see that all the box plants I had were actually two plants in one container. So what I did was I actually pulled them apart and I had two very nice little plants for the price of one. So what I've done here is I've actually got all the other plants that I've got spare now as a result of this that will I'll grow on a bit and then I'll plant out. And when you look at many plants in a pot that you buy or group, you'll see particularly with herbaceous plants it's actually got more than one plant in the pot and you can actually tease them apart and get more than your individual plant and that is a great way you can instantly up your numbers. Everyone talks about mulch, 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 mulch. It's wonderful stuff, it increases the organic matter of the soil, increases the worms, it reduces the maintenance, but it's expensive. But you can get a free mulch. And this is actually the twiggy and leaf shreddings that tree surgeons produce when they're churning up all those branches from trees that they've done work on. And they have nowhere to put most of this. So if you've got a tame tree surgeon, ask him to dump a load off with you next time he's nearby. And this is what I do. So he comes and dumps a trailer load of it in the field for me. Now, not everyone wants a trailer load and has got a field, but you can get a builder's bag from him and go and collect it from him or a sack or whatever. And it's wonderful stuff. I prefer the deciduous stuff and not the evergreen. I just think it works better on my soil. And if you want more information on mulches, have a look at my video on top time-saving gardening hacks. The hard surfaces in a garden are usually the most expensive element, but there is one really inexpensive method that you can use that I've done here. When I was working in Japan, we made miles of homemade paths on a huge project there. And it's so simple. What you do is you just take off the very organic top inch or two or whatever you've got of the soil. You then rotivate that path. If you haven't got a rotavator, I just used a hand cultivator here. Then you add in some cement and you just spread it about a quarter of an inch thick on top of the soil. Then you can add gravel and I used a fine gentleman's gravel here and you can sprinkle that over the top of the cement. Then I just cultivated it with the cultivator while I sprinkled water on it. So you're basically making a sort of slurry of cement, soil and the gravel. And then I tamped it down with a wooden board and you just move it up and down over the surface to level it off and to make a nice flat level surface to a slight fall or camber if you want it to drain well. Then you get either a roller, a hand roller I use, or if it's a big area, use a vibrating plate and you roll it over the surface. And then you cover it with something like polythene for a week as the, as the cement slowly goes off and forms a really firm path. I actually put wooden shuttering down the sides too, just to keep the edges firm and I had something to roll to. And then a week later, you pull it off and you have a lovely firm path. They use this during the war as a really inexpensive way to make landing strips for aeroplanes. In Japan, they do it really well and they gave me many different samples with different elements of gravel in. So you can have more gravel or no gravel and just have the soil and, and cement dust. This can be quite a fine art, but it can just be quite a rustic little path. I've done one to my polytunnel because I don't want it to get poached in winter because I'm going in and out of there every day. We all love raised beds. They've become so trendy and for very good reasons. Here I've got some very inexpensive forms. I just got an old builder's bag, put it on the ground and they come in various different sizes. This is quite a small one though. And then I just filled it with soil and compost and leaf mould. And then they don't look particularly attractive. So I just put round it these heather rolls so simple you can put willow twigs around it to hide it you could put hessian tied to hide it 
And the great thing about builders bags is they actually drain. When you fill them with water, they will slowly drain through. You can make them any height you want. I've just made it the height of the builder's bag and that actually is a pretty nice height. And that is a pretty nice size too. It probably took me a couple of hours to fill it. And while I filled it, I stupidly didn't level it up as I go. So if you look closely, this is slightly on the wonk, um, but next time I'll make it much neater looking, I think. Another thing that you can use is you can get pipes. If you go to concrete pipe manufacturers, they often have offcuts and they just give them away. And you can get quite wide pipes and you can just put them on the ground. It doesn't matter that there's no base. You just fill them with compost and grow plants with that. I've also done it with old terracotta flue pipes and they just interlock together. And they usually stand about that height. They're not so wide those, but I use them often to grow tomatoes in and they're just perfect for that. There are many other ways you can make raised beds and you can have a look at my raised beds by design video to see ones of timber, wriggly tin, all sorts of things. I like finding faux items, so really artefacts that are a bit strange that you wouldn't necessarily associate with the garden. And if you find different sources of these things, really the world your oyster, you can do really quite extraordinary things. I discovered Peter Evans, which is basically a theatrical supplier, and he makes all sorts of things out of plastic. And the great thing about this plastic is that you can paint it with any finish, a stone type finish, uh, a gold leaf finish or whatever. And I made the sundial from one of his sun shapes. And it's just plain white, and we gold leafed it, put it on a timber backing, had the gnomon, which is a bit that sticks out from our old door threshold, and that forms the shadow that falls onto the dial. It's very simple, and I've done busts, and I've painted them in bronze colours, and I've popped them in hedges, all sorts of things. And if you look at his catalogue, you'll see balustrades, you'll see really ornate canopies, you'll see faux brick walls, thousands and thousands of elements so you can really go to town and do something very unusual and when you look at sets in Covent Gardens and things and you see these amazing pretend sets most of them are made this way so it's a great catalogue to leaf through. You can also have trompe l'oeil you can just paint a trompe l'oeil onto a garage perhaps as we did in a garden in Stamford. I think it's quite nice to have different elements in your garden that you won't see anywhere else. And that's a great way to do it. Sometimes it's nice to make a faux gate in a garden so it looks as though your garden leads on to elsewhere. Now we've done this with a, a gate and we've put an acrylic mirror behind it. And I did this in my father's garden. He had a hedge at the end of his garden I put the gate on top of the acrylic mirror and it was at eye height and above so it looked as though the gate went on to another garden and he brought a neighbour around who visited him after he put it up in the garden and he said to her, oh I bought another acre of land behind the hedge there and she said wow Peter that's amazing how wonderful to get that land and she was totally convinced by this and it is a great way if you've got a tiny space to use acrylic mirror behind a gate or have a faux door on a boundary and it does look as though your space goes beyond. We all love structures in the garden and one of the great materials that you can use that's homegrown is of course mud. Mud buildings were made back in medieval times and many of them are still around today so it's much stronger you th than you think. We made an amazing mud hut. Now we put a thatched roof on it which was expensive. We got a thatcher in to do that. But you could of course do a, a roof and use the willow that we've talked about before or something like that and that would be much less expensive. They're lovely thick mud walls and they're beautiful buildings and you can even put a lime wash on them if you want to change the colour slightly. Otherwise we've made buildings such as a gypsy caravan which I made for the children when they were young and that was an old garden shed that someone threw out and we just put curved plywood braces on the top threw a green tarpaulin over it. We found some metal plough discs to make them wheels, we made the ladder, 
we painted it funky colours. Inside we put some bunks and they had sleepovers in there. And that cost maybe 100 quid in total. And it was really good for a fair few years. Over the years, we've made lots of Wendy houses, tree houses, all sorts of things on tight budgets. Usually they're made from off-cut supply that you can pick up cheaper than the full sheets. And then we clad them. And one great way to clad them is just to cut off log rounds. So if you cut thin slices of logs, really a hardwood is better like beech or oak and then you can just pin them onto the plywood with panel pins, just hammer them on and so you get circles that fit together and form a lovely cladding. You can also get hazel branches, so I've cut thin hazel sticks from hazel bushes in the winter because winter ones last far longer than if you cut them with their leaves on and I just nail them onto the plywood in parallel strips and then you have a hazel cladding. For the roof, over the plywood which is sloping, I've got bundles of willows which I've just cut from the garden again in the dormant season, tie them with a bit of wire and then just put them on the roof side by side and wire them into the top and you've got a beautiful willow roof. So you can really change the look of a plywood face very quickly, very inexpensively, often from homegrown items. I really enjoy creating things in the garden for next to nothing. I don't know what it is, I just think I'm very frugal by nature. And although I often work on very expensive gardens with very big budgets, I equally enjoy working on gardens with no budget and just using your imagination. I think you can really produce something fantastic for nothing.